Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, honored guests, ladies and gentlemen, friends from all ends of the world, and of course, good evening to our generous host in Yokohama. I'm connected from Frankfurt, Germany, and it's my very great pleasure to be with you for this enlightening symposium on the occasion of the Yokohama Sport Conference. Once again, I'd like to thank the organizer for inviting me to speak. I was asked by the organizer to explore on the topic sport development from vision to reality, new understandings and challenges from the perspective of my organization, Tafisa. Tafisa is a leading international sport for all organization with nearly 300 members from 170 countries worldwide. We are formally recognized by IOC, UNESCO, amongst others. My name is Wolfgang Baumann and I'm serving as Tafisa Secretary General, but I'm also happy to state that I'm elected Vice President of ICSPE, the International Council of Sports Science and Physical Education, who is one of the main conference partners, and I also have a seat on the IOC Sport for All and Active Society Commission. Today, in the next 20 minutes, I would like to share how Sport for All has developed over the years and what it means in today's world we are living in. And for that reason, I have identified four topics, globalization in sport for all, vision and mission, reality, seven key phrases, and conclusion. Looking back over the last hundred years, we can see that sports have grown into one of the most prominent cultural phenomena. Now, as a mainstream of social life, it developed into a significant segment of today's world. Sport is providing modern heroes and devils, lunch break topics, travel motifs, business booms, professional careers, national identities and theaters of mass entertainment. This has become the norm, an integrated segment of daily life. It influences how we spend our money, select our idols, use our time, enjoy public triumph and endure public despair. Half a century later, a new wave in the development of modern sport began to take shape. From the second half of the 20th century, sport grew further along an additional and globally extending branch, which is today referred to as sport for all. The, or the origin of Tafisa also dates back to the 1960s, with a semi-regular gathering of international leaders interested in working in the field of sport for all under the title Trim and Fitness. At the same time, sport all for all was a little known concept, but it all started again to increase when Tafisa was founded in 1991. Let us reflect on the inspiring quote of Nelson Mandela, sport has a power to change the world. Sport for all stands out for its inclusiveness, ability to invoke social change, central role in preserving heritage and culture, and its fundamental role for health and well-being. Sport, sport for all, is a critical piece of the global puzzle. The three words sport for all stand for a vision that portrays an ideal condition in the future. A vision is a synonym of hope, not of reality. But a vision may develop a dynamic drive if it is nourished by human hope and action. In our case, the growing participation of all kinds of people under all kinds of circumstances and in all kinds of activities being understood and shaped as Sport for All. Sport for All, which started as an idea without prestige and publicity, has made remarkable progress and the term as a right to citizenship for the first time was formulated in the resolution of the Council of Europe 1962. Today, sport is not yet for all, but it is for more than ever. What does sport for all mean today? From the perspective of Tafisa, the IOC, WHO and others, Sport for All can be understood as a systematic provision of physical activities which are accessible for everybody. The Sport for All movement is an intended deviation from the traditional sport system as it, it, as it renounces certain traditions and replaces them with others that promote greater accessibility of exercise and sport for everybody. Sport for all is therefore understood as a modern response to the basic human right and necessity of exercise and play. Then now, let us dig deep into the specific characteristics 
of the global sport for all movement at present. As a leading international sport for all organization, TAFISA recognizes seven key phrases which reflect not only the movement's success, but also documents the current position of the global sport for all movement. And you can see those seven key phases on the screen. In general, the number one keyword in the processes described below is change. The last generation has experienced more new developments in the field of sport than ever in modern history. A major part of this change has occurred in recreational sports or sport for all. The consistent growth of the sport for all movement is reflected in the increasing number of participants, but also in the expanding number and variety of national sport for all organizations. What also needs to be added is the increasing number of sport for all global events, national campaigns, and of course also academic events like congresses on conferences, all under the main issue of sport for all. It's not a TAFISA prerequisite to partner only with sport federations or governmental institutions. We work with any organization, regardless of legal structure, who are committed to the sport for all movement at the national level. Regarding the organization of sport for all at the national level, an interesting phenomenon is observed. In countries where traditional sport systems are not prepared to integrate sport for all as a legitimate and deserving subsystem, there is now a tendency for the establishment of independent national sport for all organizations working in silo from the traditional sport system. The tendency is reflected in the member structure of TAFISA. TAFISA is very proud and humbled to be recognized internationally as a leader in this field. And as I said before, among them, among our members, that by now is nearly 300 from 170 countries, uh, some 40% of these 300 organizations can be considered independent national sport for all organizations as shown on the figure. The second key phase is program. There is a great demand for, from countries for practical sport for all programs and events that are standardized and can be easily adapted and applied to their national target group. This is particularly true of the Asian, Latin American and African regions. It appears that due to a lack of experience and competence to develop their own national promotional programs, members are searching for general programs which can then be implemented in their own country. TAFISA has responded to this demand through prioritizing service delivery for members. The demand to a large degree explains the success of TAFISA programs. And I would like to name only three. The World Challenge Day. TAFISA launched the international event and has coordinated the World Challenge Day since 1990. It is an annual friendly competition between cities of comparable size with 50 million participants from 3,000 cities in over 50 countries every year. Second, the World Walking Day. It's again an annual event involving around 70 countries and uh, it is open to citizens of all ages, backgrounds, abilities and genders. It is open to every TAFISA member organization and interested municipality. Organizers are welcome to host more than one event and events of different types and scales. However, this year, and in response to COVID-19, we have totally changed the concept and developed the 24 hours walk around the world concept, bringing together people in all time zones from Fiji to Canada in one day. For more information and how to join, please check our Tafisa website. And last but not least, the World Sport for All Games. Every four years, the Tafisa World Sport for All Games take place in a display of color, dance, sports, culture, peace, friendship and fun. They enable delegations from every corner of the world to showcase their traditional sports and games. Lisbon in Portugal will be hosting the seventh Tafisa World Sport for All Games, 
originally planned for October this year, but due to COVID-19 now postponed to June 2021. I would like to invite you all here to join us in Lisbon. The third phase is recognition. Sport for All started in the 1960s as a concept without reputation or publicity. Frequently overshadowed by elite sport, it has developed tremendously and is now well respected in the world of international and national sports. An example of the new political position Sport for All holds is documented by IOC, the Olympic Movement, International Sport for All Organizations, United Nations and its bodies. And regional bodies like African Union, European Union and many others. Sport for All now is recognized by the majority of governments to be crucial for the development of the individual and society as a whole. The table reflects the importance that governments are placing on Sport for All on the political level. With the increasing participation in Sport for All worldwide, the movement needs a clear political identity and mission that can only be achieved by the commitment and motivation of all stakeholders to follow the same general aims and objectives. The new image and significance of Sport for All cor cor correlates with a new understanding of the various benefits for the individual as well as for society. Sport for All exceeds leisure time for the masses, but also mobilizes important social outcomes. The new and future message is that Sport for All is not only directed to the individual, but also embedded in a social context. What we need is an extension of perspective, resulting in the presenting of Sport for All as beneficial for the individual and for society as a tool for social change. The major success factor for future development is the exchange and sharing of experiences, knowledge and good practices between Sport for All organizations. There is no need to double and reinvent the wheel in various countries. We have to really share our experiences. A new solidarity in Sport for All as an integrative, not com competitive system is required. To facilitate a systematic and demand-oriented transfer of knowledge, we need professional tools. This includes making use of modern information technology and so on. In line with the requirements of COVID-19, Tafisa presently is in the process of transforming all of our various communication tools into a one comprehensive digital capacity building platform. One of the most frequently asked questions of Tafisa refers to educational schemes for the training and qualification of sport for all leaders. This manages the transfer of knowledge and information beyond the national level to the local and regional level of sport for all leaders. Tafisa established the Tafisa Certified Leadership Course in Sport for All, which is a five-day course to qualify young sport for all leaders. And we are proud to state that the IOC became a partner of the program with a special objective on, of inviting delegates from National Olympic Committees to participate. Thus far, CLCs have been organized in more than 40 countries worldwide, which has significantly filled the gap in educational schemes within the Sport for All movement. To ultimately reach all, the whole population, a targeted approach is increasingly applied in many countries. This includes the identification of large and significant groups of the population, such as families, women, people with disabilities and migrants, that are reached through specific and targeted marketing instruments and tools. The underlying strategy is referred to as a life stage concept, including children, young adults, middle age and older people to guarantee lifelong physical activity for everyone. The question of how to manage this diversity to target groups in sport for all, for all is one of our major challenges for the future. There is a clear indication 
that we are willing to manage the contemporary and future challenges in sport for all. However, as sport for all leaders, we must ask ourselves, is the job done? And of course, the answer is no. The turn of the 21st century brings new challenges. Sport is confronted with the challenges of a changing world. And I'm not just talking about COVID-19. There are challenges ahead of us that will require concerted efforts to improve the success of sport for all. For this reason, at its 25th Tafisa World Congress and following approval of the Tafisa General Assembly, Tafisa launched its Mission 2030 for a better world through sport for all, which now acts as a guiding strategy between now and 2030, focusing on 12 themes. This mission will provide a foundation for action and growth of the sport for all and physical activity movement to create a better world in the 12 years between now and 2030. It contains concise descriptions of the contribution sport for all and physical activity can and will make toward solving 12 critical global challenges, one for each year, and how best we can work together to make effective change. The mission addresses what sport for all and physical activity can contribute to overcoming terrorism, civil unrest and domestic violence, unequal opportunities of men and women, a lack of access to education at all stages of life, absence of understanding, tolerance and appreciation for those who are different, a disappearance of play resulting in physical illiteracy, isolation, illness, exponential urbanization, negative environmental impact by humans, loss of local traditional knowledge and heritage, corruption, unfair play, disintegration of community, disease and the associated explosion of health costs, and finally, unfair distribution of resources and wealth. And of course, to make a change, we have worked out requests to the political field, to the sport field, and so on. And on this chart, you can see a number of those changes that we are asking for to be supported by the overall system in sport and policy. For example, the elite sports movement to support grassroots and lifelong sport participation through funding and advocacy. National governments to specifically provide for sport for all within policy and legislature. The health sector to prescribe movement over medication and incentivize movement. And there are more that you can easily follow on the chart that is right now on. Sport for All has developed over the years, and the world is in need of it more than ever. Tafisa can guide and assist organizations in developing their local, regional and national grassroots sports and physical activity movement, as well as our own practical programs and expertise. We have a vast network of members and partners who bring local knowledge and on the ground experience to enrich the Sport for All movement. With appropriate international recognition, encouragement, and last but not least, investment, Tafisa and the Sport for All sector can collaboratively solve problems we may not be equipped to solve alone. Tafisa implores all its members, stakeholders, partners, and policymakers to adopt the Mission 2030 as a framework and guideline for action. At present stage, nearly 100 countries and uh, member organization have signed in to support and endorse Mission 2030. To conclude, I would like to take this opportunity to extend an invitation to you all for the 27th Tafisa World Congress, which will take place in Portorož, Slovenia, from 6 to 10th October, October 2020. This is a global sport congress with approximately 600 participants from all over the world. Participants will include renowned keynote speakers and experts from the sporting world. 
To come to an end, I wish all the success for the conference, which is now digital. And it's my sincere hope that my talk helped your conceptualization of Sport for All movement for the better world. I sincerely hope to see you all in Slovenia and let us not forget the unity will only bring us to success. Thank you very much for your attention and goodbye. Welcome to this presentation on the parallel worlds of sport development. Thank you for finding time to listen to this presentation as part of the virtual 2020 Yokohama International Sport Conference. My name is Annalisa Goslin and I'm an executive board member of the International Council for Sports Science and Physical Education or ICSPI, as well as the co-chair of the Development Committee of ICSPI. ICSPI is a leading global membership-based network of government and non-governmental organizations focusing on science, education and policy in the fields of sport and physical education. The concept of sport is universal in the world. It is probably one of the words and concepts that are recognized in almost all languages and cultures in the world. Sport has different dimensions and within the dimension of sport development, we find parallel worlds with different goals. Regardless of the specific world of sport development, role players and stakeholders need a sound understanding to effectively unlock the potential of these parallel worlds of sport developments for participants. It is then my hope that by the end of this presentation, you will have a greater awareness of fundamental concepts in the parallel worlds of sport development and add it to your knowledge base on how to apply it to empower participants to move between these worlds. In this presentation, I will present fundamental terminology and concepts in the world of sport development, clarify the notion of parallel worlds of sport development, present underlying relevant principles, point out best practices, highlight issues and challenges, look at wormholes connecting the parallel worlds of sport development, and suggest indicators that point to success in the parallel worlds of sport development. The field of sport development is research and approach from different perspectives and angles, often resulting in confusing terminology and a rather cluttered terminological space. Some of the terms associated with the fields of sport development include as you can see there, sport plus, development of sport, podium and performance sport, sport for development, sport and development, development through sport. As you can gather, it becomes a rather confusing and cluttered space. Let us then try to attempt to reduce this terminology confusion. In the broader field of sport development, we find two parallel worlds that I want to label as sport development as the first world and then sport for development. In parallel world one, it is about developing sport potential and participation from grassroots to elite levels of participation. In this world, the emphasis is on achieving sport related outcomes. In the second parallel world, or the world of sport for development, sport is used to address social agendas and communities. In this context, the focus now moves to non-sport related outcomes. Stephen Walking, the world-renowned theoretical physicist, stated that in quantum cosmology, parallel worlds exist with interlinking tunnels or wormholes between them. The two parallel worlds of sport development operate on a similar principle. It functions separately, yet it is interlinked. Visually, the two parallel worlds of sport development are illustrated in this slide. You will see 
that sport development is done in a formal sport context with rules and regulations, while the sport for development world represents a more informal sport context where the emphasis is on non-sport related outcomes. I first want to discuss the world of sport development or according to Coulter, the sport plus world. In this world, we find a two tiered approach. Sport development focuses on two things. First of all, creating an interest and desire to take part in sport in those individuals who are currently not taking part in a sport or physical activity. Access and opportunity to different sports are then offered in an attempt to increase the number of participants in a particular sport. At the same time, the second tier provides sustained support, access and opportunity to those individuals who are currently taking part in sport and encourage them to do so more frequently with greater skill levels, satisfaction and on progressive levels of performance. In general, this world, in this world, sport looks inwardly and aims to achieve sport-related outcomes. It is solely about sport and teaching sport activities and competition and winning is the end aim. In the second world or the second parallel world, the world for, of sport for development, sport looks outward and sport activities are used to address community challenges and social agendas. For example, health, education, gender equity or unemployment issues. Increasing sports skills and competition are now secondary. Sport activities now become in this world a vehicle or tool to achieve non-sport related outcomes. For example, sport activities are used to teach life skills like leadership, or self-confidence and promote personal development. At the outset, it is critical to note that both of the parallel worlds of sport development are equally important. The underlying reasons for sport development are influenced by social, economic and cultural factors. Different countries will have different valid reasons for driving and sustaining the parallel worlds of sport development. In any country, several reasons could be then relevant and valid and could include, amongst others, the reasons you see on the slide. I want to highlight only the three reasons in bold print. The right to play, exercise and access to opportunities is considered a basic human right. If we accept this, it becomes the social responsibility of a country to provide a platform for all citizens to participate in sport activities. Even if it is considered a basic human right, it does not imply that all people will engage in sport, but at least opportunities are available should they want to get involved. The second highlighted reason speaks to the issue of talent identification. Talent identification becomes the internal responsibility of a sport federation to identify, nurture and develop sporting talent and provide appropriate training opportunities for the talented to showcase sporting abilities. Thirdly, in some areas on the globe, geopolitical realities require redressing existing backlog situations in sport provision. For that reason, providing access and opportunities become paramount in both parallel worlds of sport development. The optimal functioning of the two parallel worlds rests rests on several principles. Let's refer briefly to two significant principles. The first sport development principle postulates that sport development is proactive 
interventionist and primarily concerned with behavioral change. The result of the interventions or activities should therefore be a change in physical, mental or social behavior. For example, in the first parallel world of sport development, the behavioral change could be improved sport skill levels, or in the second parallel world, the result could be improved health habits, a positive attitude towards attending school, or even a changed mindset on the value of physical activities. This implies that clear goals and objectives must be set proactively for any behavioral change to occur. The second principle of sport development recognizes and respects individuals' decision to take part or not. There should not be forced participation in any of the two parallel worlds. The decision to take part in a sport remains a voluntary one and must be respected by all. Best practices or good practices are contextual and sport leaders often need to adapt it somewhat to local scenarios and demands. It is nevertheless helpful to take note of some of the best practices presented on this slide. Following and implementing tried and tested good or best practices could certainly enhance the management and outcomes in both parallel worlds of sport development. The two parallel worlds of sport development are certainly not without issues and challenges. You will recall that one of the principles underlying successful sport development mentioned in slide 11 refers to the notion that equal opportunity requires unequal effort. This implies that decision makers in sport development have to put in extra effort and are constantly faced with issues and challenges that impact success in both worlds of sport development. I particularly want to stress the first challenge on the slide, namely the issue of contrasting the two worlds as opposing entities due to a lack of understanding how the two parallel worlds blend and interlink. The parallel worlds are equally important and attempting to elevate one world to a higher or more position, important position than the other is counterproductive and undermines the holistic value of sport development. We must guard against creating perceptions that only competitive sport has value. At the start of the presentation, I referred to quantum physics theory. According to this theory, Wormholes or connecting pathways exist between parallel worlds. Using the quantum physics theory as an analogy, one can argue that there are pathways or wormholes available to move between the two worlds of sport development, even as they exist parallel to each other and aspire to achieve different outcomes. On this slide, I identify some of the wormholes available in the worlds of sport development. Using these wormholes allows leaders and participants to transport between the parallel worlds to experience the best of both worlds when and as needed. Unfortunately, these wormholes do not appear by itself and it ultimately remains the responsibility of sport leaders to create and sustain them to allow movement between the parallel worlds. The question is often asked, how do I know if we are achieving success in the parallel worlds of sport development? Setting indicators of success is helpful to answer this question. Once these indicators presented on the slide are regularly observed in sport development practices, 
and are sustained in the practices, one might conclude that we have achieved success in the parallel worlds of sport development. In conclusion, allow me to remind you of the main ideas of this presentation. The parallel worlds of sport development and sport for development exist separately, yet are connected and mutually dependent. Both worlds are needed to address the sport development reality. Wormholes or connecting paths exist between the parallel worlds. And the synergy generated between these parallel worlds adds value and serves nation building and elevates sport development to higher levels. On behalf of XB, thank you for joining me today. I hope you have a better understanding of the parallel worlds of sport development and that you will make valuable contributions in both worlds to the benefit of individual participants wherever they are and also to the broader field of sport in general. Should you want to learn more about any of the aspects that I touched upon, please free, feel free to contact the XP office on their email or web address as indicated on the slide. Well, it's an honor for me to participate in the 2020 Yokohama Sport Conference organized in Japan and uh, at the symposium of uh, sport development and to bring the Brazilian experience on this topic. I'm going to focus on formation of the state, physical education, sport development, state and civil society, social movement, indigenous movement, and the indigenous people's games. Sport is a universal phenomenon embedded in all societies and cultures and reflects the nationalism and the group identity in its professional, Olympic, educational, leisure, and sportification movements. To understand how sport has developed in the country, it's important to visualize this concept from a broader view and the mainly factors interrelated with it. The development of sport and physical education in Brazil is interrelated with the different social political factors of society. Here we have some important information. We had the natives before uh, the Portuguese arrived in Brazil, and then we had many indigenous peoples here. And then we had uh, the Portuguese colonization and uh, we have a very long period of slavery from Africa from 16th to 19th century. And then we had other immigration waves from 19th to 20th century, Portuguese, Italian, Spanish, German, Japanese, Lebanese, and Armenians. And then in the 20th century, Japanese and the Korean, Bolivian, and Peruvian, and more recently, the Haitians and the Venezuelans. Okay. Uh, you can see the Brazilian population, the, the last census was 2010, the country experienced a large degree of ethnic and racial interbreeding, mutual assimilation of culture, and uh, we lost a lot of indigenous people, you have less than 0.5% of them. Asian, 1%, Black, 7%, Pardo, the Comulatos, 43%, and the White, 47%. Oh, that's why it was Brazil. And we have two important dates to understand the sport. First was the Independence Day from Portugal, which was 1822, and the Proclamation of the Republic in 1889. And after the Proclamation of the Republic, we have major social change happen, the beginning of freedom from slavery that had to organize the, the country, the formation of a Republican national state, and the pursuit of the Brazilian city's identity. They were looking who we were, uh, the migration waves that uh, uh, start after the um, freedom from slavery, the idea of, of building only one country that they were thinking, official language was established Portuguese, they didn't recognize the indigenous language, and the education and physical education and sports searching for identity. Okay, the um, physical education, national method, they thought that we, had, we needed to have some national method. And that was the major concern at the beginning of the 20th century. It was related to the idea of national identity and formation of only one nation. 
there were many physical activity games and expression in the country, but they didn't want to recognize in the curriculum of physical education. We had capoeira, which was played in, during all the slave period, and then the indigenous games, different kinds of indigenous games. But what they decided, they thought that the European ideas of physical education and sport could give a modern image of the country. And then it was based on the hygienic, moral, military, nationalist, eugenic, medical, education, and masculinity. Arguments were the base for physical education and sport development here in the country. Well, we had a great emphasis was given to calisthenics and gymnastics for girls regarding beauty of figure, but swimming and tennis for men and women were except for women. And the, for the boys, military exercise in presence of united order, common voice, and military posture until 1970s. And I'd like to emphasize the Maria Lenke was a Germany. Uh, she was she came from Germany family, and the she started swimming, and the she influenced a lot of women at that time. She was the first one to go to the Olympic Games. If you see a summary of the physical education in school, here we have um, starting 1851 in the primary schools, and then we have influence from Sweden, French, Germany, and then sports from England and sports performance in 1969 uh, until now. Uh, but um, and then we have influence from the sport from the United States like basketball and volleyball. Okay. Uh, I'm going to speak a little bit about state civil society and sport. The state has influenced the public policy implementing different sectors of society, schools, universities, sport clubs, and the beginning of a laboratory in, research, in the scientific research. With the development of civil society in the country, sport had other directions. In the middle of the 20th century, we had a high migration from rural area to the city. And then new social movements started here. It was not very easy because it was a struggle for them to, to be accepted and to how, how the country was, has to be organized. And then we have a long period of military dictatorship. In some way, it helped some of the, the research of uh, uh, sports, but uh, in some labs. But after that, there was a great political flexibility in our society. And then sports as right of citizen, state public policy started, and then government project and cooperation project with private initiatives. Accept more acceptance of capoeira that was played for a long time, and then they could have in the curriculum of the schools and the ASIC sports such as judo, karate, taekwondo, among others, and then we could play in the sports. And after 1970s, the we had um, uh, foundation of the Brazilian College of Sports Science. Uh, it was based on American College of Sports Science. And graduate program in different schools, in different faculty of physical education, international exchange programs between professors, research and students, and scientific research laboratory in sports in different universities. And scientific congress that started there and until now have many, in many, many, many places here. And uh, I would like to emphasize the Constitution, the seventh Constitution of 1988, that was based in, we had a lot of discussion, but the, the UNESCO International Card of Physical Education Sport, that was from 1978, declared that the practice of sports and physical education is considered as a right of all and a fundamental right of citizens. And our constitution, yes, they have in that article, it is a duty of the state to encourage form and non-form of sport press as a right of each person. Then it changed a lot. And uh, we had major social changes. You can see in the top uh, level of sports and then in the, for wheelchair dance, basketball, for uh, disabled people, and also for indigenous people and the more radical sports for women that was not used to do here in the country. And uh, you can see also in the painting from very famous painting, Portunari, you can see uh, emphasis on motor and circus practice and popular dance and were very, very, very were expressed. And um, circus was not playing, was not common in Brazil. And now you can see 
how many young people are practicing in the uh, in circles and in the clubs and the, it's, it, it changed a lot. Right? Okay, in 2015 we signed the Sport National Plan. Uh, it was in agreement to the United Nations Office on Sport for Development and Peace. They had a lot of the, the philosophy of that that um, uh, agreement uh, we could see in our sport national plan. And there was a mobilization and debate involved 83,000 people from about 2,500 municipalities. And the idea is to put more emphasis on social inclusion, promoting the development of science and technology to different networks, these two big ones, the sport as fact of cultural identity, and then they put more emphasis on indigenous games, capoeira, adventure sports, articulation with other areas of the government, justice, education, health and culture, and with civil society, expansion and the diversification of founding for sport in all its dimension and sport documentation that we have a lot of publication what they did. It. And uh, they put emphasis, a lot of things on high performance sport, the more resource athlete sponsored talent discovery, regional training center. The, we have a very good program called Second Time Program, or in Portuguese, is Second Tempo. It means the children could stay after class in the school to have experience in sports and other cultural activities. In Brazil, the public schools, the children go only part-time. They don't stay the full-time there. It changed a little bit, but in the majority, they stay only part-time. And then with this program, they could stay after class and then have experience in different kinds of sports. And uh, you can see, you know, from 2003 to 2010, the increase of uh, children that were there in this program, we attended the, in 2010, one, more than one million of people, of children. And uh, another program that we have is sport and leisure in the city. It started also in 2003. And uh, this, the, it's for everyone and everywhere. It's multi-use equipment for old people and people with disabilities. And uh, we attended 2,000, 200,000 people in the, in the whole area. And uh, we still have the program, but uh, you know, with the COVID, it's, everything stopped. The schools are closed, and uh, even uh, in this black, uh, it, they, you know, the, all these programs just stopped. And after 90s, we had uh, also very important social change in, on education, and uh, we have the education based guidelines that were thinking about social inclusion, person with a disability implementation of mixed physical education class in all grades before the class was only for girls or boys but now they can have mixed physical education class and also the teacher can teach either for girls or boys for men or, or women i mean it, especially now that is together they can teach before no the professor the teacher it's only for boys, men, and women for, for girls. And um, we have very different civil society initiatives. The um, SESI is Social Service of Industry. They have a very good program. It has been for a long time, even before the Constitution. They were there, and they have uh, very good facilities, and uh, they could form very good athletes, even top level athletes. And the social server commerce too, they have extremely good, good program that is still there and the, for a long time. And the other, and then we have different confederations like Brazilian wheelchair dance. I'm going to speak a little bit more about the, this confederation. We started founding, it was founded in 2001 and, uh, but the idea is to have the scientific knowledge, artist dance and para dance sport, because it was found in the State University of Campinas. And then we always link it to the scientific knowledge, not only sport separate. And when we had the, the wheelchair dance competition, we always had the scientific knowledge together. We started in 2002, 
in Campinas, and then is the last one was in Juiz de Fora in 2019. See how many cities we had all this championship. And that this year we are going to have an online, something new because of pandemic. And uh, it's going to be in October 17, 18. But we had to have only two categories, single and freestyle, because they are going to record and then send it to the, the, the judge to, to, to judge you know, the, the, the categories or the, the dance. And it's something very new. And the mechanism for dissemination of wheelchair dance series through clubs, shows, top operas, films, blogs, YouTube videos, to the internet and the classroom and online course, especially now that we have more online course because of the pandemic. We have another good program here. It's called Agita São Paulo program that was organized by Sela Fiskis. It's a center of study in São Caetano do Sul, in the, in the area of the São Paulo. And it's a multi-level plan that promotes messages about the health benefits of physical activity based on scientific information. It starts in the state of Sao Paulo and disseminates in different states in Brazil and Latin America. And uh, it's, a, it's a very interesting program. And uh, it goes for ecological model. What means that uh, you have the interpersonal, is the personal, the social environment, and then the physical environment. The physical environment means that uh, we have to have the city, the, the city policy to, to be with us. And then many of the cities, they adopted and they have different natural environment, constructed environments, and then we have so many good facilities that are for people to do the physical activity um, in open area, especially in open area, uh, uh, social environment, and then interpersonal. And the idea is to change behavior, what means that to step-by-step -step model we call is passed from sedentary to somewhat active, somewhat active, regular active, and then more active. You go one step by step to change your life, you know, to, to practice more physical activity. We have also in this program, what they call Agita Crown, for, it's a school program for uh, students and the young, it's more for young people that we have folks and they will have one day of the Agita Crown, and during the, the whole year, they, they decide what they're going to do. It's a very interesting program. It's getting more and more popular. And then we have the Active Community Day, and for it includes the schools and teachers, homes, and then the squares and the clubs, everything related to, to this. Okay. The, um, this program started in the state of Sao Paulo, but uh, other states in Brazil, they adopt and also in different countries in Latin America. And then plus some of the um, other uh, European countries. And then we have what they have, Agita Mundo, what they kept the same name, Agita Sao Paulo, uh, is to agitate it. And Mundo is in part with world, but they want to keep it with the, the name in Portuguese, and because Agita Mundo, and then we celebrate in April 7th. It's a day to celebrate the World Health Day. Okay, another specific group that uh, it started here is, I'm going to speak a little bit about the indigenous peoples. The indigenous peoples in Brazil, they were considered transitory subject. That is why we was being prepared to enter civilization civilization. They thought they were not civilized people. And then we had the, the organization called Indigenous Protection Service, and then more recent FUNAI. But uh, the first one, the SPI, they had different policies to try to integrate them. And now we have a, a lot of problems. But so, you know, after the Constitution, they finally recognized the Indians their social organization, costume, language, beliefs, and tradition, and then therefore their cultural popularity. Many, we had many chains here, and then many uh, indigenous organizations in politics and in health and uh, education organized. And in physical education, in sport, more sport, what you can call, 
the Intertribal Committee of Memory and Indigenous Science start organizing the Indigenous People's Games. It started in 1996. Those two brothers, they are from the Terenas ethnic group, Carlos Justina and Marcos Mariano. And um, the idea is to bring the games and rituals from the indigenous lands to the city to celebrate, not competing. Um, but it's a very interesting way of they organize. They, they start in, from them, from their ideas, but they have the federals first to work with them and the Minister of Sports, Education, and Culture, Indigenous Foundation, FUNAI. Indigenous Foundation is the foundation that is responsible now for the indigenous people in Brazil. Plus, the state and the city department of sport, because the, the, um, uh, the teams, the, the, the competitions are organized in the cities, so they, they depend on the, the city. And the participation of media, universe, NGOs, guests from different entities, and the general public. In the games, you can see the coexistence of scientific knowledge and bureaucracy, the way that they had to deal with all the bureaucracy to organize the big games. In general, it comes 2,000 people in the games. And the traditional knowledge, it's, you can see, you know, it's, it's the, 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 the same area, you can see both, both, both of these knowledge. And the, the idea is the, the remote, the aim of the games, the important, thing is not to win, but to celebrate. The celebration is the folks. And it started in Goiânia in 1996. And then the last one was in Palmas, in Tocantins. There was the first World Indigenous People's Game. And probably we're going to have another one. This It's supposed to be this year. But with the pandemic, they change next year, probably going to be in Rio de Janeiro. And what happened there? They have the opening, the arena where the the games happen, the hand craft to sell the, the handcrafts, the social forum where they discuss all the different problems, health, education, and politics, and the, the food square, and the displacement logistics. That was very hard to bring groups from Amazon to the Centrest, to the south of Brazil, in that city where they are going to hold the indigenous games. And they have different uh, activities like rituals, canoes, log running, uh, tug of war, archery, and uka uka, and others. And the, it's interesting the role of women. The first years, they came just to watch and accompany husband to the games. And the, mo the mothers always bring the small children. They never leave the, the small children in the lands. Where they go, they bring. Dance is in the ritual and handcraft to sell during the games and social forum to discuss different subjects. And uh, the games, um, they permit myth, cultural values, and congregate the symbolic world of different ethnicities. Every practice has a symbolic meaning. The indigenous men and women are in the process of empowerment, self-determination to national and, and, and international levels. The efforts are presented in the organization of teams and matches. It's interesting, it's, it's football, but it's amazing. They bring their, the way that they organize the team, the way they, who, how they play, and then how they celebrate in different ways. And then you can see the difference among them. And the indigenous women, uh, now they can participate in the public life more in the games and sports that before they, they didn't do. Build a new social roles, rethinking and affirm their rights, indigenous and national societies. Okay, some final considerations of this presentation. Uh, sport and physical education in Brazil were intervened with the different sectors. The state played a key role at the end of the 19th century and it still does today. Physical education and sport had its roots in the European ideas. The development of civil society has played a key role in promoting the sport through clubs, federations, and professional entities such as SESC and SESI, the commerce and the industry. The Brazilian constitution of 1988 reinforces sports as a duty of the state. In this process of social change, empowerment of women, people with disabilities, and minority groups, indigenous people, and immigrants. 
the research congress, national and foreign exchange of professors and research have subsidized research in these areas. Agita São Paulo program had significant impact on different sectors of society. Finally, what you can suggest advancing the area of sport development, emphasize more sport education, leisure and celebration for all, provide opportunities for low social economic class, people with disability and indigenous people, as well as contributing to gender equality. The COVID-19 pandemic is exacerbating the country's social and economic difference. It shows clear how much we still need to move towards a humanitarian sport governance that meets the different layer, layers of society. And reinforce sport programs related to climate change, something there, there are new, and then we think we need to relate, food security and nutrition and obesity, combat sedentarism, prevention to chronic degenerative disease, pandemic, public policy and social conscience, public policy, physical activity programs, sport, improving urban rural mobility, ecosystem of innovation, sustainability, and resilience. Okay, I have some bibliographical reference, and I would like to thank you very much. I have here my email if you'd like to contact me.